Good morning and welcome. This is the Sunday morning sermon for April the 3rd, 2022 for Black Rock Baptist Church. We started a series of messages last Sunday entitled Easter. This changes everything. A series of messages, four messages that will take us up to uh, Easter Sunday. Uh, we hope that uh, you might be able to join with us in the sanctuary as we celebrate on Easter Sunday, but if not, that uh, message will also be up here online for you to see on the videos. This morning, I want to share with you number two in this series of messages as we uh, focus upon the events of Good Friday. And number two in this series is entitled, A Day of Surprises. We focus upon Luke chapter 23, verses 26 through 47. And we continue in our Easter series this morning with a close look at what happened that first Good Friday, the day that Jesus died on a Roman cross for the sins of all mankind. And now please understand that to the typical Jerusalem resident, the day Jesus was crucified began in a way that was not at all different from any other day in Jerusalem back in that day and age. The Romans were always crucifying someone. John MacArthur writes this, he says, By the time, by the time of Christ, Rome had already crucified more than 30,000 victims in and around Judea. So crosses with dead or dying people on them was a common sight around Jerusalem and a constant reminder of Roman brutality. Now, the Gospel accounts shows us that to those who witness what happened, this day was anything but routine. There was nothing commonplace about this day. Leith Anderson points out in a message that uh, he preached on this text, he points out that this was a day of surprises. Things happened on that day that shocked people, things that got their attention and made them stop and think for a moment. Perhaps the best example of this fact is seen in the experience of the man by the name of Simon. Dr. Luke tells us that Simon was from Cyrene, a city in North Africa. Simon had no doubt come to Jerusalem as a pilgrim, a pilgrim on the journey of a lifetime. Maybe he had saved his money for a long time in order to be able to afford to travel all the way to the holy city to observe Passover. I also think the event in our text happened right after Simon had arrived in the city. In my mind, he is a tourist, right off the caravan, just beginning to explore the holy city that he had heard so much about all his life. So I'm certain he was surprised when he stumbled across a, a crucifixion parade on those unfamiliar streets. And then what normally would have been a brief delay as he waited for the procession to pass by turned into so much more than that. Well, as I said, this should have been a brief delay for Simon. Just a couple of minutes, enough time for three victims and their guards to walk on by on the pathway. But a surprising thing happened. Jesus crumbled under the weight of his cross right at Simon's feet. You may remember that the day of Jesus' arrest had been a very tiring one, so tiring that the disciples, well, they couldn't keep their eyes open as Jesus prayed that night in the Garden of Gethsemane. They fell asleep. They were so tired. And then after his arrest, an already exhausted Jesus had been beaten literally within an inch of his life. And so it's understandable that what little human strength that remained would finally give out. And as I said, it did. But right as he crossed 
Simon the Pilgrim, the tourist pathway. Now, as an occupied city, Roman law gave its soldiers the right of conscription. In other words, they could draft anyone they wanted to do their bidding at a moment's notice. The custom for a soldier was to take the flat part of his spear blade and put it on the shoulder of any person anywhere, and that person was immediately brought into the service of Rome. Well, with Jesus and his cross on the ground, it's obvious that one of the Roman soldiers realized that Jesus couldn't go any further. He couldn't carry the cross. So he exercised his right. And he took his spear and put the blade on the shoulder of the closest able-bodied man, who just happened to be Simon. Thus conscripted, poor Simon is forced to pick up Jesus' cross and carry it for him. I'm sure he was not only surprised, but probably embarrassed and even angry at the Romans. Luke doesn't tell us anything else about Simon. But this man from Cyrene does appear in at least two other places in the New Testament, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, verse 32, and in Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 21. The fact that Simon is mentioned in all three synoptic Gospels suggests that later on, he had become known to each of the gospel writers, which would indicate to me that he became a Christian. Another thing we should note is that in this account of this incident, Mark expands on what Luke tells us. And Mark informs us that Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. And I'm sure you'd agree that it's an unusual thing for a father to be identified by his children, unless, of course, his children were well known. And so we can assume that by the time Mark's gospel is circulated, two of the very well-known Christians in the Roman Empire were Simon's boys, Alexander and Rufus. I mean, the only reason Mark would have mentioned them by name would be because he knew his readers would recognize these names. He knew his readers would know who he was talking about. Later in Romans chapter 16, verse 13, we find Rufus mentioned again, described as the son of a woman whom the Apostle Paul considered a surrogate mother. Now, as I said a moment ago, if you put these pieces together, it becomes obvious that Simon had become a Christian. His surprising forced conscription to carry Jesus' cross became a doorway to eternal life for him. I think we can also deduce that when he returned home, Simon told his story about Christ and the crucifixion to his wife, who not only became a Christian herself, but also a substitute mother for the famous apostle, Paul. Simon shared his faith also with his sons, Alexander and Rufus as well, who became two of the well-known Christians in the church of that day. So what started out as a frustrating surprise and an embarrassment turned out to be a wonderful serendipitous event for Simon and his entire family. In fact, I'm sure he would tell us that his chance encounter with Jesus was the best thing that ever happened to him, an event that changed everything in his life. I mean, the purpose of a pilgrimage is to get closer to God. Well, Simon met God in the flesh. You never know what God has planned for you at any moment. 
Secondly, the events of this day also led to a surprising encounter for some women along the Via Della Rosa, the pathway that Jesus walked with the cross. Women standing on the route of Jesus' crucifixion parade. Luke tells us that after Jesus was released from the weight of the cross, he continued the journey to the place that in Latin is called Calvary. In English is called the skull. And en route, he passed a group of women who were crying and mourning. In fact, they were screaming out, not because they knew Jesus and were sorry that he was going to be crucified, but in all probability, they had never met Jesus. So think of these women as kind of professional mourners. Of course, they didn't, uh, that, that doesn't mean that they were unsympathetic. They were women who dared to come out when men were being crucified, when their families came and cried over their deaths. Well, I'm sure they were surprised that day because never before in all of their tears, in all of their wailings, in all of their journeys to all of their crosses, never before had they ever had a man do what Jesus did. He actually turned and expressed sympathy for them. He said he anticipated difficult days for their future and for the future of their children. He told them that uh, he was sorry and that they ought to be wailing for themselves, not for him. Jesus' concern was never about his own problems or his own pain. No, Jesus is always focused on the problems and the pain of others. And hear me on this. It may surprise you to know that on that day, on that first Good Friday, 2,000 some odd years ago, it may surprise you to realize that even then, as Jesus walked behind Simon, even then he was thinking about you and your pain and your suffering. You see, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, was on his way to die for you and me. That's why he was there that day. And Jesus knew that. He knew at this point that his suffering and his death was for our sin and our rebellion, yours and mine. His death was payment for every sin you and I and every human being ever born or ever would be born would commit. And I believe each of those infractions, each of those sinful thoughts and words and deeds and omissions, all of our sin, each of our sins was on Jesus' mind that day. Let me put it this way. Those women were shocked to see that Jesus wasn't focused on his own agony, but rather on their agony. And mine. And yours. How does that make you feel? I mean, we talk about the cross so much that we kind of become desensitized as those Roman soldiers. But the fact is, that was God carrying that cross. All-knowing God, completely loving. So way back on that day of days, his heart of love was breaking for you and me. He was knowingly, willingly dying for our sin. You know, when a criminal was put to death on a Roman cross, the soldiers would scrawl out the nature of the crime on a, on a little wooden sign, and it was hung around the neck of the one that was being crucified. It was hung there so that onlookers could see the offense that had led to his crucifixion. Well, in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, Paul tells us that Jesus took our guilt and nailed it to his cross. 
He took our sins, yours and mine. The charges that were against us, the handwritten death sentences that belonged around our neck were carried with him as he was nailed to the cross. The only Son of God died conscious of the fact that he was, uh, he was doing so for every sin that you and I commit. In his book entitled, He Chose the Nails, Max Licato writes this. He says, between Jesus' hand and the wood of the cross, there was a list, a long list of our sins, our mistakes, our lusts, our lies, our greedy moments, and prodigal years. List of specific sins. Dangling from the cross was an itemized catalog of your sins. The bad decisions from last year, the bad attitudes from last week, there in broad daylight for all of heaven to see was a list of your mistakes. Jesus knew the price of those sins was his death. And since he couldn't bear the thought of eternity without you, he chose the nails. The hand squeezing the hammer was not a Roman infantryman. The force behind the hammer was not an angry mob. The verdict behind the death was not decided, decided by jealous Jews. Jesus himself chose the nails. Jesus didn't die impersonally for all humanity lumped together. No, he died personally, individually, for you and me. Does that surprise you? Does it shock you, humble you, convict you? To know that on that day, Jesus' mind and his heart was focused on you, because it was. Thirdly, this event reminds me of another group of surprised people, and that being Jesus' executioners. In fact, I think the biggest surprise that day came to those tough veteran soldiers who so many times before had crucified other men by nailing them to wooden Roman crosses and then watched them writhe in pain for hours or even days before death finally, mercifully came. As the condemned men screamed and suffered, these soldiers would sit at the foot of the crosses and they'd play games. That might seem callous, but as I said, their cruel duty, repeated so many hundreds of times, had desensitized them to the, to the curses, to the pleas, to the threats. I mean, these guys were men who just were not caught by surprise. Nothing shocked them. They had seen and they had heard it all. Every curse word, every phrase conceived of by depraved minds of tortured men. And yet never before had any of these hardened soldiers heard what Jesus had to say that day. For as his hands were nailed to the cross and the nail was being driven through his feet, and the cross was lifted upright and dropped into the socket in the ground. Instead of cursing them, Jesus prayed audibly for them, saying not once, but over and over again, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. Think of it. While others were mocking him, in fact, just as their taunting had reached a fever pitch, Jesus responded in precisely the opposite way that most men would have. Instead of threatening and lashing back or cursing at his executioners, Jesus prayed to God on their behalf. Even at the height of his agony, compassion was what filled his heart. Compassion even for his cruel executioners. The men who had mocked him, the men who had beat the flesh on his back into a consistency of hamburger. The men who had nailed his hands and his feet to the rough cross. 
He had compassion for them. And this unheard of response was enough to shock the toughest of soldiers. So it's no wonder that when the centurion made his final inspection after Jesus' death, he paused long enough at the cross to say, Now this one, this one was a righteous man. Surely this was the Son of God. The forgiveness of Jesus was a surprise to them. But you know, it's a surprise today as well. I don't know about you, but I, I'm shocked at his forgiveness. I mean, Jesus knows our worst sins. He knows not only our sinful action, but our inactions. Our most hateful and even murderous thoughts. But when we ask, he still forgives. Now, the Bible clearly teaches that all sin is against God. And I know that when we are wronged, our response is to try to get back at the person who wronged us. I mean, when people trespass us, our first response is to want to trespass against them. So I, for one, am surprised that no matter what our sin, no matter how disobedient or rebellious we have been, when it comes to God's loving law, no matter what we've done or what we do, Jesus' heart still seeks to forgive. And God still longs to forgive us. No matter what our sin, he yearns for us to repent and turn to him so that we can receive the forgiveness he freely offers through Jesus Christ, his son. Number four. Now, please understand the surprises on that day that Jesus died were not just for those on the Via Della Rosa, not just for those who were along that pathway to the cross, or those clustered around the cross. These surprises were for the whole land, for everyone. I say this because at noon the most extraordinary thing happened. It became dark as if it was night. And I'm inclined to believe that it was not just limited to the Jerusalem area. As verses 44 and 45 say, the sun stopped shining over the whole land. In other words, midnight came at midday. It was a deep darkness, darker than even the darkest night, I believe. I don't think you could see a hand in front of your face. I don't think the stars or the moon were visible. It was as if the light of the world had gone out. I imagine the soldiers scrambled to find their torches to enable them to be able to see so they could complete their gruesome duty. It was that dark. In fact, I would say that Darkness like this had not ever been seen in the world since the day of Genesis, when Genesis says the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the earth. This day should not have surprised the Jewish religious leaders. After all, the prophet Amos had written hundreds of years earlier he wrote, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth on a clear day. Well, I think it would be an understatement to say that the people living on this first Good Friday were surprised when this happened. They knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God was doing something special here. That in these three hours from noon until three in the afternoon, something unprecedented had happened. And it did, because in that time period, the wrath of God against the sin of all mankind 
was poured out on Jesus Christ. Again, from John MacArthur, he writes, It was a punishment so severe that a mortal man could spend all eternity in the torments of hell, and still he would not have begun to exhaust the divine wrath that was heaped on Christ at the cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says that on that day, Jesus, who knew no sin, was made sin for us. No wonder it was dark. It would have been incredibly inappropriate for the sun or any other light in the heavens to shine in the face of such horror. And this leads me to the fifth point, or to the fifth surprise on the day Christ died. It affected only a few, but their surprise must have been profound. And that was the surprise for the temple priests. It occurred at the temple in Jerusalem, the, the center of Jewish life and worship. Try to imagine the surprise of those on duty in the temple that day, a day in which the sky was so dark that they had to light all the candles in order to see. Imagine their surprise when, at the precise moment that Jesus uttered his final words and died, this thick curtain, a curtain that was 60 feet wide and 30 feet high and several inches thick, I say it was about nine centimeters thick. This curtain, which surrounded the Holy of Holies, was torn in two from top to bottom, according to Matthew 27, 51. And it opened wide so that they could see into where they had never thought they would ever see, into the Holy of Holies. These priests realized that something amazing had happened. God had opened up his presence to everyone. Never again would there be a curtain that would keep God at a distance. Never again would a priest have to represent everyone else. Now all of us have direct access to our holy God. This thick curtain that separated, uh, separated us from God was no more. What once separated us from God has been removed. Ephesians 2 and verse 13 says, Now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away from God are brought near. And Ephesians 2.18 says, For through him, Jesus, we now have access to the Father by one Spirit. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 says, Brothers and sisters, we are completely free to enter the most holy place without fear because of the blood of Jesus' death. We can enter through a new and living way that Jesus opened for us. It leads through the curtain, that is Christ's body. And then also Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with great confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. All this leads me to point out that not only was that first Good Friday a day of surprises, it was a day of salvation. Verse 40 tells us that one of the criminals crucified with Jesus rebuked his partner in crime who was hurling insults at our Lord. He said to him, don't you fear God? And then he asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom. And Jesus promised him not only that he would remember him, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So the day of his, this criminal's crucifixion became the day of his salvation. And we refer to this dark day as Good Friday. 
because it has become the day of salvation for billions of others who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, just as that repentant thief had done. A day of surprises. Good Friday. Thank you for joining with us this morning. Join with us again during the week for our short devotionals. And then next Sunday, of course, is Palm Sunday. And we'll be focusing upon that event as we continue in this series of messages. Easter, it changes everything. God bless. Have a wonderful week. Let's continue to exchange prayers daily.